Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Wills Rats Church this morning. Hope you're all well. Hey, have you had a good Easter break for those that have been on holiday? Brilliant. Welcome to those that are online as well this morning. Um, trust you're all well. Um, we're here. I'm Ben, and this is Harriet. And Harriet's going to bring us some notices. Good morning. Okay, bear with me. I was just saying to Ben, this is very small writing. <laughs> so it's coming up here. Um, okay, so this is, this is a really lovely thing to say um, about youth work because we have had lots of new families come, which is absolutely wonderful. But we just wanted to make it clear about the youth work that we have available in church, particularly on a Sunday morning. So if you are youth, year six to eight, then you'll be going upstairs. Fire starters, age three to 10, you're in the side hall and sparks are the littlies, naught to three, and you will be going in the well. Um, it will become apparent in the service when everyone goes out and there'll be people at the back just to help you go in the right direction. So you are all very welcome. It's great to have you and um, yeah, any questions, then just ask somebody on your way out. Uh, church family meeting, 25th of April at 7 o'clock. Yeah. Um, I've been asked just to mention, please prioritise coming, uh, mainly because we've got lots of celebrating to do and lots of significant information and praying through big changes and things that are going to be happening within church. So please get that in your diaries. Um, and another, this is all very exciting. Uh, back, going on. Yeah, 12th of May, potential baptism date. Um, so if you are being prompted to get baptised, um, something you're thinking about, you'd like to ask some more questions, uh, there will be an uh, exploring baptism course. Uh, and if that's for you, then again, maybe speak to one of the pastors, one of the leadership team, and they will point you in the right direction. Swapping to bigger writing now, so we're good. Um, next Sunday, so lots of this came out in the weekly update, but next Sunday is Vision Sunday Lunch. That is the 21st of April after the service. Um, ideally, could we know numbers by the end of Wednesday, just so we cater accordingly? Um, primarily, that's for those, maybe you're new here, new to church, um, exploring membership, things like that, might have some questions. Um, so we'd love to serve you with lunch whilst we talk a bit more about that, so do come along. Um, Compassion, last Sunday, um, Daniel from Compassion spoke to everyone about if you sponsor a child and since then a poster has gone up on the back wall with a QR code so if you can update your details on there um, QR code is the way to go and finally a subject close to my heart community day which we're all very excited about but we need lots of help please and I know that Katie sent an amazing um, update out this week about community day it's the 18th of May please save the date and if you can come and serve take part and volunteer I would love to hear from you so um, I've sent an email out um, specifically to those who wanted to be involved or help last year um, if you haven't had that and you would like it, please could you just email the office and I will get in touch with you. And finally, all of the above. I understand that all of the things we've spoken about this morning um, are very tech-based. So if you are not online, if you don't do emails, any of those things, we don't want any barriers. Um, so please speak with me and I will make sure I point you in the right direction. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, well done. <laughs> One or two announcements there. She's done a fine job, Rem. <laughs> <laughs> Exhausted, that's it, take a seat. <laughs> so, um, before we uh, go into praise, we just wanted to consider what it was prayer was. So that's, that's what God put on my heart this week about prayer. And I was thinking about Easter and the Easter account and everything that goes up towards Easter. And I was thinking, what does Jesus actually teach us about praying? So I was, I, was looking through the, I was looking through the Gospels and come to um, read Mark. Uh, Mark 11 speaks of when Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he goes to the temple and all the traders are there in the temple doing everything they shouldn't be. And Jesus overturns the tables and he, cut and he gets them all out, doesn't he? And he says, he says to the people that my house will be a house of prayer. And he's quoting Isaiah 11. I'm just going to read a couple of verses from Isaiah 11 to lead us off. Which says... Which is... I will also bless the foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord, who serve him and love his name, who worship him and do not desecrate the Sabbath day of rest, and who hold fast to my covenant. 
I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And this is what Isaiah got from the Lord a long time before Jesus was on, was on the earth. And I thought to myself about our church. I thought, we're a multitude of nations in this church. And we've all got that in our hearts that Jesus has given us to have that ability to commune with him through prayer because of what Jesus has done for us. And I was thinking about the priority that we should make that. We, we seek to make that a priority in this church and we strongly encourage each of you to come along to prayer meetings, to get involved in prayer corporately, but also individually in your, in your homes. So what I want us to do this morning is I want us to stand, if you're able, and I want us to put prayer first and foremost of this, of this service, of what, we're, what we bring to God this morning. So that that is our priority. Because when we are taught to pray, we are taught the Lord's Prayer. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 6. He gave us the Lord's Prayer as a simple pattern for our prayers. And if, it's, if prayer is something you find difficult, look at the Lord's Prayer and look at the pattern that's in that. And the first thing that Jesus teaches us is to give God all the honour. And that's what I want us to do this morning. So I just want us to stand. And if you feel comfortable, I want you to just shout out words of praise to God that will give him glory, will give him honour. And then after a moment, I'll ask the band to uh, start leading us in praise. So let's just spend a moment in prayer. Yeah, Father God, we just praise you this morning for who you are, for your holy name. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You reign over each one of us, Father. Your kingdom will come. Your will will be done because you are a gracious God who watches over each one of us. Thank you for loving us. We praise you this morning. Yeah, Father, we, we still our hearts before you this morning. And we say, Father, you are great. You are the one and only God, the three in one. And we bring you our praise this day. May our hearts be open to receive who you are. May your Holy Spirit dwell in this place. And we have that fresh sense of who you are today, Lord. In your holy name, amen. Oh 
Dave, you are glorious in battle. You have won the victory, Lord Jesus. And we proclaim that over this entire family, this entire nation, Lord Jesus. We declare this over the globally, over the world, Lord Jesus, that you are victorious. That you have won each and every one of our battles. And we are so grateful, God, that you come to meet with us, that you chose to be in a personal relationship with us, Lord Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Lord.
fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. Let's say, let's declare that out now as, a, as one body. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. Stand a chance when I stand in your
ही से देनी है give you space to come God will you draw near to us and then it goes open our ears open our hearts we want to know you open our ears open our hearts we want to know you God will you draw near to us okay Thank you. 
we're just going to offer up some prayers to, to God now. And I just want us to offer up our, our hearts at this time. So just spend a, a moment reflecting on this week that's gone and thinking about cleansing your heart, cleansing your soul, putting before God those things that perhaps haven't been as they should be. Yeah, Father, we, we bow before you with repentant hearts, Lord, asking, Lord, that you would wash us anew, cleanse us, Lord, of those things that have not been right, those things that we thought might have said or done that are less than honouring to you, that don't say or speak of who you are. But Lord, it's you we want to glorify. It's you we want to honour. And in everything we do, Lord, in our being, may it be soaked in, in the spirit of the Lord Jesus. You are with us, Lord, and we draw close to you so we will experience you in a greater and deeper way. Then we will know what your will is for our lives, Father. And we thank you this morning for Jesus. For the cleansing that Jesus brought into our lives because of the pain that he suffered. And we thank you, Father, for him. And for what you've done for us. And we thank you, you've come back into, back to life in amazing resurrection power. And that you are alive. And that you do rule and you are over all and you are controlling everything, even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it. So draw us close to you to know that you are with us. So that when we're at work, when we're at home, when we're in the shops, when we're resting, that we will know that you are with us. because we just want to speak of who you are. We want to speak of your glory and the power of Jesus over other lives, Lord. So in everything we seek to do, Lord, in this church, whether it be in the youth, whether it be in, in the community, whether it be at Braybourne, we pray for every facet of the work that we, we, we undertake in your name here, Lord. May we see fruit. May we see people giving their lives to you. Being baptised and repenting of who they are at this time. But being lifted up in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Father, our hearts think of this world and the pain and conflict that there is. And Lord, we just particularly remember the conflict in Israel at this time. And Father, we pray that there will be protection upon those there, upon those that are living there, that there will be a resolution that can only come from you, Father, that comes into the hearts of those men and women that lead, that lead those, those governments. There would be reconciliation because of the love of Jesus. So come into that place in almighty power, we pray. And that you will be known. Yeah. We just thank you and we bless you. And in a moment, we'll take up the offering. So we just offer our, our thanks for all, all your provision to us, that we are able to bring your money into, into this place and to extend the work that we do here. So we thank you for all your provisions to us. In your holy name. Amen.
yeah, so in the next worship phase, we'll, we'll take up the offering. Sorry, I thought you said something. <laughs> and um, we'll, uh, yeah, take up the offering. And if you haven't got any money, don't worry, it's not a problem. We have a card machine at the back if you've got that option. If you're a guest or a visitor here, don't be, feel that you have to give. This is uh, something that we do as a church as part of our uh, worship. You heard my phone say Psalm 50. It's because I was looking at the Psalm, not just, you know, playing on my phone. <laughs> but I wanted to read the beginning of it, not my phone. So I will read it. <laughs> and the beginning of Psalm 50 says, The mighty one God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets. From Zion, which is in Israel, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather to me this consecrated people who made a covenant covenant for me by sacrifice, and the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. So that's kind of why I wanted to like feed that into your prayer before you added in the offering bit. Um, But it's just as relevant. If you can go home and pray Psalm 50 over what's going on in the Middle East at the minute, that would be incredible, absolutely incredible. Because, you know, there's people that we know there, there's people that we have connections with there, you know, there's people that are there right now. (laughs) And um, yeah, we need God to shine forth in that place. We need for him to summon the heavens above into, into Israel, into Gaza, into the West Bank, into Syria, into Iran, into Iraq, even into that whole Persian Middle East world. He is the only one that can do what needs to be done in that place. Humans have messed it up badly, badly. And he can bring peace. So let's carry on, let's carry on in that vein.
is free indeed. Mm. It's free indeed. Yes, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Yes, Glory. Lord. We thank you for your presence here, God. We thank you for the power in those words, Lord, that I know sometimes we don't feel it. Lord, sometimes we feel like we are slaves. Lord, we are slaves to fear. We are slaves to this word, Lord, but we declare freedom. Lord, we declare it over our hearts that don't always believe it, God. We are children of God. We are known by you. We are seen by you. We are loved by you, Lord. And we declare that truth. We claim that truth, Lord. We are victorious. We are heirs. We have authority. We have been getting everything we need, God. Thank you. Yes. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So if you're new or visiting or joining us for the first time online, I don't know where I'm meant to be looking right now. Hello to those of you online. Um, my name's Katie, and I am one of the pastors here. It is so great to have you with us. And I hope you've all, if you've been off for Easter holidays, you've had a great Easter holidays and are ready for school tomorrow. Woo! Or your kids to go back to school tomorrow. Woo! <laughs> I don't have kids, so I'm all good. But anyway, so um, we are doing a series at the moment on, um, I forgot what it was called for a second there, All Things New. And this morning we are going to be looking at renewed identity. So who am I, right? Who am I? Uh, I love that some people are going, Katie, that's who you are. You're Katie, as if I'd forgotten. So what were you saying, Izzy? No longer a slave, but free. Amen. Um, the age-old question that I think all of us, pretty much most of the time, ask ourselves is, who am I? What is my place in this world? What defines me? What is my significance? Who am I? And I think one of the greatest crises that is facing society, particularly in the West, is around identity. Yes. People don't know who they are. So they're grasping at straws for things to define them. And the thing is, nowadays, there are no set rules. Literally everything is up for grabs. You know, not even gender is defined anymore. It's kind of you, whatever you feel like you can define yourself as. And the thing is, no wonder there is so much anxiety. No wonder there is so much chaos out there. How are we possibly supposed to figure out who we are when truth is relative? There is no truth, right? There is nothing, right? How are we supposed to figure out who we are when literally everything is up for grabs? You know, there are no foundation of basics that we can build our identity on. There's just nothing. And it's like shifting sand. I don't know if you've ever tried walking up like a sand dune or, you know, like a bit of hilly sand. It's so hard because it's just shifting all the time. It's shifting under your feet. You're trying your hardest. You're really fighting against it to stand up and keep upright and not like an absolute fool falling on your face, right? And the thing is, as well, nowadays, everybody wants to be special, don't they? They want something that makes them special, something that makes them different, something that sets them apart from everyone else. And the thing is, is we need a firm foundation of knowing who we are to function, don't we? You know, or we struggle to flourish. We struggle because if we're constantly thinking, oh my goodness, who am I? And there's just nothing there, of course we're going to struggle. And imagine, like, you are, picture it in your head, imagine if you are, you're on a sand dune and you're trying to walk up the sand dune, light, right? Or if you've seen Dune, you're Paul Atreides trying to catch that worm. Is that going over a lot of people's heads? Probably. That's okay. I love Dune. Yes, thank you. Oh, such a good film. Anyway, <laughs> you know, imagine you are trying to, you're trying to push against it. You're, like, walking up, you're walking up. It's so exhausting, isn't it? You know, there's people that are like, I like a romantic walk along the beach. I'm personally not one of those people because I'm walking on the sand. I get tired after about five minutes and I just want to go back on the path because I'm like, oh, it's too much hard work. Or like at Hythe with the rocks, right? Where it's just a struggle. Does anyone else find that or is it literally just me? Is it just me? No. Thank you. Sorry, I thought you were looking at me like, are you being serious, Katie? Like, you're so lazy. No, it's hard work. On that shifting sand, on the shifting rocks, it's just hard work. And when we have the path, you know, when we have a firm foundation, it's restful, it's easy, we can enjoy it, it's firm, and it's trustworthy. It's the same thing with identity. Unless we have a sense of identity that is firm, that is trustworthy, we're going to be flailing around, grasping at straws, trying to figure out who on earth we are and what on earth is our place in this world. And when we know who we are, when we have that sense of security, we can crack on with what we need to do. Because we don't need to worry about that. We know who we are. We can just get on with life. 
So, like, as I said this morning, we are looking at renewed identity. And what I really want for us this morning is to have that firm foundation established of who we are in Christ. And for some of you, that might mean it's a fresh revelation today. Maybe some of you have never had that sense of identity, have never had that sense of security of knowing who you are in Christ. I believe that God wants to bring that this morning. I believe that he wants to bring that revelation of who he says you are, not who the world says you are, not who people have sp- what things people have spoken over you that has been hurtful. I want you to know who God says you are, and I want us to be a church that stands on that, who knows who we are in Christ and are confident in that so we can crack on with the Great Commission. So let me read to you from 2 Corinthians verse 5. Since then, we know what it is to fear God. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our minds, as some say, it is for God. Um, If we are in in our right minds, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. This is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Powerful, isn't it? So I always think it's good when we chuck a bit of chunk of scripture in there, it's good to understand what's going on, a bit of context around it, because while that is powerful in its own right, you know, when we explain a bit more, it opens up the passage. So this was in one of Paul's letters to the church in Corinth. It's called 2 Corinthians, but it was unlikely to be his second letter to the church in Corinth. It was probably like his third or fourth or something like that. So Paul is writing to to the church in Corinth. And often when Paul writes a letter, it's because there's an issue. You know, you'll see that in some of his, he's like, come on guys. So Paul would have planted the church in Corinth. He's writing to them because something happened. And from the letters, we can infer that people were rejecting Paul because he wasn't a particular good speaker. You know, I think sometimes we assume Paul was probably this amazing preacher. Apparently he wasn't that great. He was okay, but he wasn't a particularly good speaker. He didn't have a lot of money. You know, he wasn't particularly appealing in a lot of senses. Apparently, he had a monobrow, but I don't know how accurate that is. It's in the Apocrypha. Not that monobrows are wrong. Oh, no, monobrows are fine. They're a vibe. Anyway, sorry. Oh, I have a monobrow. It's all good. Anyway. (laughs) Shut up, Katie. Um, (laughs) You know, and he, he, like, made tents to fund his mission. So he he was a hard worker, right? And the thing is, the church in Corinth got caught up in the Christian preachers who were a lot jazzier than Paul. You know, the jazzy people, you know, and they didn't want to associate with Paul anymore because they were like, oh, like, oh, he's not particularly appealing. But this guy, oh, he's got fancy clothes and everything, you know. Um, Therefore, Paul here is encouraging them to take pride in them as they proclaim the gospel and teach from their hearts when others that seem more impressive aren't necessarily preaching from their hearts, but maybe are just preaching to be seen or whatever it is. And we see that Paul, and we love it about Paul, Paul is compelled, and I love the word compelled. He's like thrust into it. He cannot but proclaim the good news. He's compelled to preach the gospel and tell people about the death and resurrection of Christ. And he understands that the message is for all, like literally everyone. And Paul goes on to say that he no longer looks at people from a worldly point of view. And this is really key. So the church in Corinth were dazzled, you know, by those who looked great and sounded great, you know, the charismatic types. And Paul is telling them that that isn't always reliable. 
And it's so true, isn't it? I always say, never trust a charismatic person. It sounds awful, but it's the people, careful, yeah. I never trust those that like, they're very much like, oh, look at me, look at me. It's the people that are really passionate, but they're kind of, they're not pointing to God, they're sometimes pointing to themselves. It's just be wary of that. And Paul's saying, actually, don't look at people with worldly eyes. You know, the ones that are attractive or, I don't know, dress nice or whatever it is, look with the heavenly perspective. And that's really important that we too, like Paul, should not look with our worldly eyes because they trick us. You know, people can trick us. Look at people through the heavenly eyes, through Christ's eyes. And actually, it's recognizing that the world saw Jesus through worldly eyes and they crucified him. The son of God, they saw with a worldly perspective, we want someone to overthrow the Roman you know, occupation. We want a mighty you know, warrior. And they saw Jesus who was humble, who was a servant who washed feet. And they said, crucify him. So it's a good challenge for us. And Paul tells us that if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. And I love how here he does a bit of a new sandwich, doesn't he? He's like, the new is here, the old is gone, the new is here, yay, the new. And I just love how he does that. So in other translations, it says that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. So as you hopefully realize, when we give our lives to Jesus, when we invite him into our hearts, when we invite in the Holy Spirit, physically, we don't change. We look exactly the same, our voices sound exactly the same, and from a worldly perspective, nothing's different. However, everything changes. When we give our lives to Jesus, everything changes because we are made new. The new creation is here, we are told. The new order, Christ has died and conquered sin and death, and he has all authority. There is a new order, and we in Christ are also made new. Isn't that good news? Oh my goodness, I'm like, thank goodness. So you might be sat there wondering, what is this newness? Thankfully, Paul continues. So Paul says this, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So because of sin, because of mess, because of this broken world, we were separated from God, right? There was a, there was a divide between us. But now we are brought back into right relationship with God through the forgiveness we find through the cross, through the sacrifice that he made. But we too don't just get that reconciliation, we have a ministry of reconciliation. That is something we are all called to, that we are called to invite people back into right relationship with God or to find right relationship with God, which is part of the Great Commission, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. To make disciples is to help people reconcile with God. It's helped to draw people back into that relationship. And Paul continues saying, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. As ambassadors, or an ambassador is an official representative who has been given power to act on behalf of of the one they represent. So that is someone who represents a nation or whatever, and they've been given power to represent that person in situations. And we know from last week that Jesus' disciples are sent to continue Jesus' ministry on earth. And in fact, the disciples are told elsewhere in Scripture, they are told that you will do even greater things, which is incredible. You You are going to do even greater things than Jesus did while he was on earth. But we aren't just told to carry on, you know, the Great Commission to do that in our own strength. We have been granted power through the Holy Spirit at work in us on behalf of Jesus. So we don't have to do it on our own. We don't have to fulfill the mission of God on our own. We have the Holy Spirit at work in us, which is crazy, isn't it? You know, God has equipped us to do all that he has called us to do. And he didn't just entrust us with his mission. He gave us that power to fulfill it. And what an honor it is to be Christ's ambassador. What an incredible honor. Jesus was like the nicest guy ever. And we are his, well, obviously more than that, but we are his ambassadors. And what I love so much about God is that he entrusts all of that with us, even though we don't always feel worthy, even though we don't always feel like we're good enough, 
even though we have a lot of fear and a lot of insecurities, he still chooses us to be his representative, warts and all, which is amazing. But we aren't his representatives on our own. And I think this is really key. This isn't just about individual discipleship and each single person making disciples on their own. We are the body of Christ. We are not the individuals of Christ. We, God's church, the family of God, we are the body of Christ. We don't have to do any of it alone. We do it as a family. That's why we have church, is because actually God recognized that it's too much for one person on their own, so he gave us the church. And because God so loved the world, he gave the world the church. Because we are to forward God's mission, we are to share God's love with the world, and we do it together as a family, because we work perfectly together. All our personalities, all our gifts, that is why God brought us together, and in Willsborough specifically. Like each one of you has a place here, you are an important part of our family. And when we work together as a family, as the body of Christ, that is when God moves in power. If you want to do something quickly, you go on your own. If you want to go far, you do it together, right? I don't think I've said that right. I just it's fine. But we, if we want to really see God's kingdom breaking through, we have to forget that we are individuals and remember that we are a family. We are a unit. You might not know everyone in this family because we're always changing. We're an evolving family, and that's fabulous. But we are a family. We move together. We share together. We encourage one another. We build one another up. And when we truly act as the body of Christ, we will see huge change in Ashford, in Finbury, down the M20 and into France when we work as a family, which means all of us need to step up. All of us need to recognize that we are an important part of this family and you might feel utterly worthless, but you are not. You are important and we do this as a family. And to fill, fulfill God's mission, he gave the world the church and we have to remember that. The church is so important and we often get it very, very wrong as I think most of us have seen. But God gave the world the church for his mission. Our entire function of being is for mission. Our entire function, and yes, we gather together to celebrate what God has been doing in our weeks, how he has moved in our lives, and how, who we've seen come to faith. We celebrate together and we go out because we are the sent ones, and we do it together. We do not do it alone, which I think is amazing. And we're so bad at doing stuff together, let's be honest. I think particularly like British culture, we're useless at doing things together. But we're learning and we're growing and we're trying. And I'd love it if our church was such an example of how family does mission together. As a whole family, kids, youth, everyone, we do mission as a family. So when I reflect on my own journey of faith, my own journey of discipleship, I realize that actually the biggest thing that always gets in my way of pursuing after Christ, of pursuing after his calling, is myself, right? 99% of the time, I don't feel worthy. I don't feel good enough. I often feel like an absolute bumbling fool when I try and talk to people about Jesus. Or someone comes to me with like a, you know, a pastoral situation, I'm just there like, <gasps> you know? That's how I feel most of the time. And I imagine that's true for most of us. We don't feel good enough. We don't feel worthy. We don't feel like we know what we're saying or what we need to do. Who am I to be Christ's ambassador? So let me tell you who you are. Let me tell you who you are. All of this is drawn from scripture and I'm gonna read these over you and I want you to let them soak into your hearts and soak into your bones and let these truths replace lies that you've been told and you've been believing for a long time. Is that okay? So let me tell you who you are. When you believe in Jesus, this is who you are. You are a new creation in Christ. Yeah. You are a child of God. Yeah. You are justified and redeemed. You are an heir. Yes. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are a member of Christ's body. You are an ambassador of Christ. Yeah. You are chosen. You are forgiven. You are made alive in Christ. You are raised and seated with him in heavenly places. You are God's workmanship. You are a citizen of heaven. You are no longer a slave, but free. You are Christ's friend. 
I love that. You belong to God. You are a holy saint. You are valued. You are beloved. You are wanted. You are complete in Christ. You cannot be separated from the love of Christ. You have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. You have not been given a a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You have been chosen and appointed by God to bear good fruit. You are a fellow worker with Christ. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. All that is who God tells us we are in scripture. All of that is from the Bible. That is who God says you are. You want a firm foundation of identity, that is it. Because the world will lie to you. We lie to ourselves, but that is truth. And do we always feel that? No. But it doesn't matter what we feel. It doesn't matter what we think. What matters is truth. And what matters is that we stand on the word of God and that is it. That is the word of God spoken over you and you might, sat there, you might be sat there going, oh, no, 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 none of that's me. Rubbish. When we decide that we aren't what God tells us we are, we are partnering with the enemy and we are saying, oh, I'm not good enough. That's you saying, yes, Satan. Of course, Satan. No, we want to say, yes, Lord, I am enough. I am redeemed. I am restored. I am whole. I am chosen. I am wanted. I am loved. That is who you are. And that is what we stand on. We must not allow the world to define us. We must not allow that. You want to find who you are. You are sat there going, who am I? Look to the Bible. And what I love is that God's truth is always loving. God's truth is never harsh. It, is never, it doesn't bring on guilt. It doesn't bring on shame. It's just love. He wants to empower you, to equip you, to call you to do greater things than he has ever seen. He loves you. He has got you. Let that be your truth. And when the enemy comes in or the world comes in and says, you are not good enough, what do we say? No. Back off, Satan. We're not having that. I am loved. I am mighty. I don't always feel it, but I am it. And we declare it over ourselves over and over again. And I encourage you to find a list like that or watch this back and write it down. I should have written it down. And just in the morning, just declare it over yourself. Just declare it. Just say, Lord, I claim, do you know what? I feel miserable and I hate myself today, but I claim that I am loved. I claim that I am a child of God. I claim that I am redeemed. I claim that I am holy. We are holy. We are righteous. God tells us that we are through the sacrifice that Jesus made. How incredible. I don't feel holy most of the time. I get stuff wrong all the time, but God says you are holy because he has paid it all for you. You are free. All of those lies, all of that doubt, you are free of that. And we don't always feel it, but it doesn't make it any less true. Okay? And when we know who we are, when we wear that truth of what God says we are, when we stand on that truth, then we can just crack on with the mission God has given us. Because we don't need to worry about ourselves. We're good. We know we're loved. We know we're established. We know that when people reject us and laugh in our faces, it doesn't matter because we're loved. It doesn't matter because the king of kings, the guy who literally made the galaxies, made the universe, thinks you're spectacular. So how dare we let the voices that tell us that we're not be louder? How dare we not believe in who God says we are? How dare we think we're not good enough when the king of kings has says that we are? And we need to declare that over ourselves. And I love it because Jesus, Jesus knew who he was. He knew who he was. He knew his purpose on earth and he did not need to make a big song and dance out of it. He did not need, not need to point out the fact that he was literally God incarnate. He didn't feel the need to point it out every five minutes, did he? He just got on. And from that place of truly knowing who he was, knowing he was loved, knowing he was empowered, he was able to serve. He was able to take the lowest position and wash people's feet because he didn't care. He didn't care what people thought. He didn't care if people were like, oh, only slaves do that. Jesus didn't care because he knew who he was. And when we know who we are, we can truly live for God because we have that confidence and assurance that we are loved that we have life eternal, that we don't need to worry because he's got us, because he is a good father who loves us. We can just get on. And if we look like fools for the gospel, fantastic. Right? Great. 
Let's look like fools for the gospel because we are loved and we are only put on this earth for a finite amount of time. There is a mission to be getting on with. There is a job to be cracking on with and then we can chill out in heaven, right? Let's get on with it. Let us stop allowing insecurity, fear, ourselves hold us back. Other people, you know, fear of others is huge. Fear of man's massive. N- enough, like n- enough of that. Let us know who we are so we can walk in confidence knowing that we are Christ's ambassadors. Amen? Amen. Now, words are great, but the spirit's better. So let's just take some time. I, this morning, there's just been a real sense of let's just wait on the Lord. I love that, um, that song. It just, oh, it's such a good song. Let's just wait on God. I know that pretty much all of us probably have some stuff that God needs to work on, right? Some insecurities, fear, anxieties, all of that stuff. Let him do his work. And let him bring that revelation of who he says you are to your hearts so that it becomes who you are. And let us let go of all that rubbish that holds us back. So I encourage you, if you're happy to, to shut your eyes because otherwise I think we get a bit distracted from what God is saying. Open up your hands and just let him meet with you this morning. Yes, Lord, we thank you that you declare those truths over us, Lord. And I do pray for our, our hearts that are often too broken to hear the truth. Lord, we declare that truth, that we are loved. Lord, you see all the awful parts of us, Lord, all the intrusive thoughts we have, Lord, all the not nice things we think, and you still choose to love us. Lord, you still want relationship with us. It's not even like you have to have relationship with us, God. You want to. You want to know us, and you want to be known by us, God, and that is such a privilege. And Lord, often it feels like we come with dirty hands, Lord, to worship you. We come and we're, we're covered in dirt and muck and mess, Lord, but you are a God who makes us new. You are a God who washes us down and says you are free. You are free of that mark. And Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you wash us sometimes all the time and you you don't ever get complacent, Lord. You love to forgive us. You love it when your children come to you and say, Lord, I'm a bit messy because, Lord, you can wash us clean. When we repent of our sins, God, you wash us clean. And we thank you for that newness. Lord, I declare that newness over us. Lord, we are not old wine, we are new wine. We are new in your new covenant, God. We are washed clean. We can know God. We can love God. We can be your friend when we were once enemies. And Lord, I know there's more work you want to do, Lord, and sometimes that takes a lot of surrender from us. Lord, we like to hold on to things that we think define us. God, I am this. I am that. And Lord, I feel like this morning you're just asking us to open up our hands and let go. Our past hurts don't define us. Our trauma doesn't define us. The words that parents and loved ones have spoken over us don't define us, God. Only you define us. And you will never speak harsh words over us. You are never mad at us, God. You just love us. You are not an angry God. You are a loving God. You are love. So, Lord, I pray in this next bit of worship, Lord, that we will just open up our hands to you. And, Lord, the things that we think we are, Lord, I pray that you will just say, that's not who I say you are. Mm -hmm. And you will speak into that, God, and free us of that. We welcome you, Lord. We welcome your spirit. We welcome you now. We open our hearts. We open our minds. And we want to see you, Lord. We want to know you. Thank you, God. I wonder if maybe um, in this next bit of worship, if you maybe just want to pray for one another in you know people who are around you you don't need to know what it is that you don't need to say to anyone what it is that god's doing business with you on but i just feel like as we're one body it's really important to do it together you know that's what exactly what katie's been saying you know we don't yeah we do business with god on our own but we also do it together and you don't need to share anything you're not comfortable sharing but i would really encourage you to just turn to the people around you if you don't know them or you don't feel comfortable Maybe find someone you do know. And if you're totally new, find Katie and Harriet and Ben at the front because they are trusted people who we love. (laughs) Not that any of the rest of you aren't, (laughs) but they're safe people. Um, We want this to be a really safe space. And as we continue in worship, yeah, as you're doing that business, you have to renounce lies in order to replace it with truth. You have to say, I renounce the lie that I am unworthy or rejected or unloved or shameful and replace it with the truth that is that I am loved I am not unworthy I am worthy 
I am loved. I am accepted. All of those things. It's really important to reject the lies. If you feel a lie coming into your heart, reject it, replace it with something that's true. Yeah, so if you want to stand or just sit. But I would encourage you to pray for one another. See you.
yeah, I really get the sense that this morning needs to be like a stake in the ground when actually we might have said, Lord, I'm going to believe your truth. I'm going to stop believing these lies. But this morning it's about putting that stake and saying, I'm not going to believe those lies anymore. I'm not going to speak those things over myself. I'm not going to believe what the enemy has said to me, the broken words that have been spoken over me. I'm going to believe in you, God. And it's standing in that. And tomorrow I can guarantee you'll go home and feel rubbish. You'll wake up and feel rubbish. But you wake up and you declare, I am loved. I am free. I am redeemed. So let's put that stake in the ground and truly believe who God says we are. No matter what doubts are in our heads, no matter what's going on in our hearts, we believe because it is truth. So let's put that stake in the ground.
Father, we thank you this morning for the blessing that it is to come and dwell in your presence, to bring our praise to you and to know, Lord, that you have changed each one of us, that we are a new creation made right in you, full of the Holy Spirit. Go forward and do your work. And Lord, as we seek those opportunities to share your love with others around us, may we go boldly, confident in the knowledge that you have gone before us to do that work and that you are with us in whatever words, actions, deeds we find ourselves faced with this coming week. So we thank you for the grace and mercy of you, Father and everything that you pour out in our lives. And may we know that and hold on to that as we go forward. This day, today and forever. Amen. Amen. And yeah, Father God, I just want to add to that. Um, the strength is what Katie spoke to this morning about us being a family. Um, and the importance in that and that we're not in this alone and we've all got each other. Um, and that come, coming with family comes team. And God, I thank you that we're a great team. Mm. Um, but I particularly pray over this congregation that um, this week we will be empowered. Um, and just give us the opportunities to be a clear ambassador for you. Mm. Um, and as we just come to a close now, um, I pray that we'll just have lovely chats. Chats with each other, chats with those we know, chats with those we don't. Mm. Um, and we just pray this in your name. Amen. So alas, Amen. now is the time for coffee. So as I said, have a, uh, grab a coffee, have a chat. Uh, we will be here next week. Um, and yeah, let's do team on Sundays, but during the week as well. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. <laughs>